thousands of years ago, they were Apollo, Zeus, Ares. Now they are Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, and the other heroes and villains of DC and Marvel Comics. Join us every week as we discuss the legendary stories, characters, concepts, and other parts of comics as we examine the modern pantheon of heroes. Let's get heroic. Welcome to Under Two Cates, the podcast for the comic book fan. Welcome to Under Two Capes. I am Jared, and I know today we said we were going to do a Suicide Squad, but that episode is going to be actually tomorrow, so Lad can, and I can come on and compare notes about which teams we pick. So basically what we're going to do is, um, longtime fans will remember that one of the earlier episodes we did is we made a ju- our own custom like a Justice League slash Avengers teams out of like I'm pulling it up right now out of like um, out of uh, Marvel characters and D- DC characters, but they couldn't have been like on the original squad, if you will. That episode was, I'm just pulling this up real quick just so I can check. That's what would be. Um, let me see. Um, your source team building, how to fix Marvel comics. I'm just l- looking through our episode actually wait wait that was actually uh it will comic knock us let me see uh well the point is one of the original episodes that, that we did for the podcast was was um was, uh, was once again where we talked about our different teams so we're going to do that for super villains except so we're basically going to make our own suicide squad for dc and i guess Thunderbolts for Marvel. We're going to essentially create a Suicide Squad in Marvel as well. So that's what we're going to do right now. But I mean, that's what we're going to do tomorrow. And then we'll have the Bad Batch review episode tomorrow where we talk about the recent episode. But I didn't want to leave you guys without a weekend episode. So I decided I would hop on because a lad has a thing with his family. So I wanted to talk about Ultimate Captain America um, Volume 1. And this was written by Jason Aaron. And uh, this is part of the Ultimate Universe, which Marvel started a little while ago, um, like a couple of years ago, to like basically modernize, to to basically ground Marvel in the in the uh, in the real world a little more. So this is kind of um, think of this as they're creating the mcu all right so the um the ultimates ran from 2000 to 2015 it was an imprint all right so ultimate captain america now those of you who know me know i'm a huge captain america fan and so what i wanted to do the reason i wanted to cover this story is because it's it, it places steve in a really interesting dynamic where he has to fight against basically an evil version of himself Not like in Secret Empire, this one's cool. All right, so the story opens up. I'm just going to give you a brief overview of the plot. Story opens up with sort of a flashback scene. It's like, so you know how in stories, when they start off at a a further point in the story, and then they do like 24 hours earlier, and uh, and they do a flash, uh, essentially a rewind, that's kind of what this book starts off with. So it looks like Captain America is captured. He tries to break out, but then he's like subdued. They throw him in a uh, in a cell. And what's kind of interesting is that Captain America is praying. And then the guy goes, okay, so I'm going to show you your gods is nothing. So I'm going to just leave. I'm going to leave for like a minute. And then when I come back in, I'm going to kill you. And you'll see that no one can help you. So the story p- goes back six weeks ago so this is in north korea and the north koreans are experimenting with their own super soldier program or because remember what had originally happened was so steve rogers became captain america through what's called i think it's project rebirth during world war ii but um the formula and dr abraham erskine i think that's what his name was if i'm pronouncing that correctly was killed 
if you remember Captain America, the first Avenger movie, that's basically what happened. So the U.S. government couldn't replicate it. That's why Steve is pretty much the only official super soldier. I mean, I know you have the Winter Soldier and such, but he's the main guy. But other countries have tried to replicate that formula to an extent. This is where you get like North Korea trying to create their own, I guess, Captain North Korea. I guess that's what that would be called. So anyway, now uh, let's let's go on. So then uh, we have this mask character, which when I was first reading this, I thought this might have been Taskmaster or Sportsmaster. Or, uh, well, Sportsmaster is DC. Uh, I thought it might have been Taskmaster or like some other like like mass known character but his identity is revealed later and it's really freaking cool so anyway all of a sudden there's an alarm going off and then the north koreans pull up the security cam and find a, 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 a british sas team now the sas is basically think of them as their version of the navy seals essentially except well army but they're they're essentially their main special operations unit so they're going in, and then uh, so their plan is to unleash the, the super soul. Actually, no. So the guy, the, the mask character, go. Well, let's call him Mask. He goes, okay. So we're gonna basically make sure that they don't know what we're doing here. So he goes into the room with the with the North Korean super soldier and slits his throat. While he's doing that, the uh, <laughs> the British are taking heavy fire. Then all of a sudden. Our good boy, Steve Rogers, shows up. And for those of you on the audio, I am showing the, the comic book on the camera. So if you want to see visuals, go to, uh, to Comics League Network on YouTube. I will place the link in the description of the audio episode. All right. So uh, again, Mass shows up and he, and he kills a North Korean super soldier. And then also lights the body on fire. So the, so the body is like, <laughs> is like, so the evidence is like, burnt to a crisp it's gone so next so S steve follows the uh, follows mask up to the roof and they get into a scuffle but what's interesting is that then this guy starts talking he's like well yeah you were on the roof uh, i mean when you were frozen for 75 years someone had to take your place and everyone's like huh that's interesting and then also it's kind of interesting is that Steve is on the radio with Hawkeye and uh, an even co a cool version of Carol Danvers. Just wanted to put that out there. Right, anyway, so they get into a battle, but Mask escapes. He, he eventually escapes, but he and Steve get into a massive fist fight until uh, so Carol Danvers identifies the guy as Frank Simpson. And she's the, uh, and Carol's the one who actually knows who he is. So, so she, she's like, "Oh no!" And then Hawkeye's like, "Who's this guy? Never heard of him." So anyway, as the, as the story progresses, they're still having a battle, and then Mass takes off his. Um, now, what Carol shows is that Frank Simpson Mass has the same super soldier serum in him that Captain America does. So everyone's like, "Wait a second! I thought there wasn't any more of the serum." Now, and then it's also revealed that he was declared MIA or missing in action like years ago, a, a, um, a decades ago, in fact. So, and then it says Captain America of World War II, meet the Captain America of Vietnam. And then he takes up the mask and then it, he actually tattooed an American flag on his face. And he goes, I'll show you what America really stands for. So I was saying what I like about the story is that is that it's addressing the concept of patriotism, which is always like brought up in Captain America's story for obvious reasons. So anyway, Steve breaks up in Paris, Carol's in his room and she, and she basically relates to him that they were trying to, uh, that the US government was trying to replicate Captain America because Vietnam and um, what happened is that, okay, so, it, so, so basically, he, here's what Carol Danvers says to Steve. Poor kid signed up th thinking he was going to be Steve Rogers storming the beach of Normandy, m machine gu gunning Nazis. Instead, he found himself in, in, in places like Dock 2, Kesa, and, and the Shao Valley. They dumped him in, into the meat grinder and left him there for five years. So basically, what they did is they dropped him in, in, in the middle of the Vietnam woods and just told him, go. 
go. Just he was basically a fire and forget rocket. That's it. Just fire and just go back to whatever the, the heck you were doing. Now, what it now, and the reason why they let him get away with it is because his kill count was through the roof. But what eventually happened is that they started to, uh, but they were so obsessed with how effective he was as a soldier, they were ignoring the the telltale signs of this guy's not right in the head. So what happened, it, it, so, and the US government thought he was going to be the new Captain America until he just ups and goes. He disappears in the middle of the Vietnam War. He just walks off the base. And I love how Cap goes, uh, is, is, uh, so he quit j- just like that. And Kara goes, maybe. But there were rumored sightings month, uh, a month later that, that suggested he hadn't quit at all, just switched sides. And then Captain America goes, that traitor. So again, Captain America, so the thing about Steve, even in the ultimate universe, is that he's more of you obey your, you, it seems like he has like a very simplistic view of patriotism, meaning you support your country no matter what. And that will be addressed later on in the storyline. Boy, I love this story. So anyway, so what was great is, so it, it, Carol Danvers is ordered to keep Steve in that in the household room to keep him from going after Simpson. But then she's like, she, so then Carol starts talking to him and be like, it would be a shame if you broke out, I guess. So uh, St- Steve catches on. He goes, okay, how real do you need this to look? So Steve goes, so, so uh, Carol goes, pretty real. So Steve punches her because he's trying to make it look like they had a scuffle and then he escaped. So he jumps out the window and then... T- Carol Danvers goes, not that real. So anyway, week later, Steve is in Cambodia and he's trying to track down Simpson. He figures he went, that Simpson's based in Vietnam. So Steve goes around, he, he starts a- asking around uh, for, for Simpson. It's cool. He's, like, he's walking around, his shield's in his backpack, just walking. What's great is that this kid tries to shoot him with an AK. Steve takes out his shield and just whacks it at the guy. And then more, more of Viet, uh, Vietnamese uh, guerrillas show up, and he takes them out. Now, what's what's great, it, what's good, is uh, uh, what's interesting is that he says, "Okay, so where's Frank Simpson?" And then the the, uh, the guerrilla goes, "He's in Salah." He goes, "Where's that?" And then the the uh, the guy points him. So then Steve uh, starts w- walking through the Vietnamese jungle. He's hacking his way. He's basically pulling a full Indiana Jones. He even walks by a temple. So anyway, so what's interesting? He said, so, uh, so so he goes through, and then Steve has this great monologue where he's talking about about uh, Frank Simpson, and he goes, "It's just what he talks about is that he says." I remember 1944, waking up one morning in the Ardennes for, forest, freezing cold, knowing we were surrounded on all sides by, by a Nazi tiger tanks, and I couldn't move. It took me hours to get out of bed. I, I could have broken then, like the men I saw eat bullets from their own guns. At the time, I felt like I could almost understand uh, why they were doing it. But flipping sides, there's no understanding for it. Frank Simpson betrayed his country. He said he wanted to show me what America really stands for, but he's the one who who, will be getting the lesson. America doesn't stand for cowards and turncoats, not my America. The America I I know always been worth fighting for, even dying for, and sometimes killing for. So again, Steve has that. On the surface, it looks like a simplistic view of patriotism where my country can do no wrong. On the surface, it may look like that. It'll be... Revealed later that's more nuanced. But anyway, so Steve r- r- reaches Salah. If I'm pronouncing that wrong, I'm sorry. I'm, I don't speak Vietnamese. So anyway, shows up. And what's hilarious about Captain America walks in. So at this point, he's wearing just like a shirt and jeans. And then he decides, okay, I'm approaching a village. I'm just going to dress down into the Captain America outfit. That's not going to draw attention. So he dresses up. He goes in. And he goes, okay, so where's Frank Simpson? And this old guy's like, okay, so he goes. So then the the old guy throws Steve. So and like throws him, an old guy. And then it's like an old lady p- picks him up and throws him. And then what Steve reveals is 
they're all super soldiers. So essentially what Simpson did is he went to a, this Vietnamese village, gave them all to the super soldiers a formula that he managed to replicate. And then so, oh, also uh, before he throws them, the old man gives him a nice monologue about how, it, like he goes, I used to feel that flag you wear, you wear th that flag that dropped bombs, killing my brothers and sisters. Uh, he goes on and talks about, uh, he's not afraid of that flag anymore. Because he's a super soldier. So and then Steve is captured by Simpson. And he goes, okay, so here, so I have so much to teach you, Steve. And that's the end of issue two. Issue three opens up with S Simpson's going, I never slaughtered any civilians, never raped anyone, never killed a single baby. All I did was fight. I went where they told me to go, killed who they told me to kill. I believed every one of their lies. So they go on. And then uh, he, he said, uh, it, I imagine they labeled me as PTSD, but I've never been more sane. So then he throws them in. So he starts talking about Richard Milhouse Nixon, former president of the United States. You know, the guy who, who did the Watergate trial and everything. So he's trying to, to break Steve of his patriotism and his faith in his country. So eventually uh, what we find out is that so, so time passes by and Steve is tortured. And then he's, and then what, what Frank is doing is he's reading basically a laundry list of all the atrocities the U.S. government has committed over the years, and once again, psychological torture. He's talking about the um, 1969 Cambodia and Laos became the most heavily bombed areas in human history, because so what had, what had happened is that in Vietnam, we uh, the U.S. military noticed that a lot of the the insurgents and the NVA, North Vietnamese Army guys that we were fight that they were fighting, were fleeing into Laos and Cambodia. So we figured let's just bomb, let's just carpet bomb that entire like stretch of land. Bad idea. Let's just bo bomb the border between those two to, to like make it so there's no way they're going to get through that. Didn't really work out so well. So again, they keep going through through all this. He's basically committing psychological torture. It, 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 he shows him Agent Orange. He makes him l l l listen to screams of uh, of um, of people who were tortured by U.S. backed rebels. He even rigs him up so he's forced to look at the at the torture images, if you will. So anyway, they waterboard him. They basically completely uh, mess with Steve Rogers. They're and then there was this one part where Steve apparently broke, almost broke out, but then again, people um, people beat him up and bring him in. So then anyway, Captain America walks in and he, uh, well, not walk in, Frank walks in and he, he brings with him two captured S.H.I.E.L.D. agents and goes, are these guys with you? And then as it, as it turns, uh, so he interrogates me, he goes, so the, the mission was, uh, they were sent in to find Steve Rogers because once again, he went AWOL. So uh, basically he makes them admit that they were uh, there to capture Steve. Frank makes the S.H.I.E.L.D. agents admit that they were there to save Steve Rogers and then he just shoots them. So he basically kills them. He kills all of them. And then, um, and then so, so we, we keep going on. And then we see, uh, so basically what they've been doing to Steve in addition to torturing him is that they've been continuously drawing his blood because they're going to use his blood to synthesize the super soldier serum. And that's originally, I believe, how Frank got the serum. So, so then uh, Steve is, is, again, more, more tortured. And then what's interesting is that uh, apparently Simpson is taking pills, but what's interesting about the pills is that there's red, white, and blue. So again, America. So we get we return to the scene from the beginning of the book where Captain America bre breaks out of his um, of his cell, is thrown back in, and said, "I'm going to come back in a minute and kill you." So then Steve actually sees what he uh, it, again. The Lord provided. And then so when Simpson comes comes in, he doesn't know it yet, but Steve had uh so what had happened is that Steve had 
had, had so there was a king cobra in Steve's cell. So what Steve did is he killed it, took the venom in his mouth, and then what, what would happen is that he spat the venom in in Frank's face, and then this starts a big like a big brouhaha essentially between Steve and uh, and Frank, and they engage in in a pretty intense battle, like. He, like eventually um what i noticed what that was actually kind of humorous is that steve uh, uh frank takes steve and just whacks him uh, against trees like baseball bats and they eventually get into a hammer fight with frank ha having like two construction hammers and then steve having like this type of hammer with a big handle and then the, the, they have the hammer fight and then steve actually wins and then what he so what eventually happens is that this is what he says it's just so this is where steve reveals like the nuanced view of patriotism that he has he goes um you think i've never heard of richard nixon before or every other earth-shaking secret you've had to tell me i know all those stories and a hundred more just like them that are even worse Peace and security don't come easy, Simpson, and wars are never pretty, no matter the era. But we do what we can for the greater good. Has America made its share of mistakes? Obviously, you're one of its worst. I think it's about time we remedied that one. So anyway, so what Steve essentially said is, has America made, made mistakes? Sure, 100% it has. You can look, look to history. It's in, indisputable that America has made mistakes. But that doesn't uh, so essentially what it means that it doesn't shake his view of the country because what steve believes in was the um, is the idea of america and, and that's uh, what true patriotism is where you believe in the good your country can become and even if it's not that good now i still think america's great but that's besides the point so and then, and then steve goes okay so anyone who uh, so, so steve is surrounded by, uh, by the, the super soldier villagers but then steve goes okay Anyone that uh, that's still aiming a gun at me will be treated just like that guy. And he points at Simpson and he goes, okay. And they, they drop the gun. And he goes, smart move. Now bring me a radio. And he calls in shield still does not kill Simpson. So, and, and then it cuts where it, to the trace Skellion, which is the headquarters of the ultimate Avengers who are in this universe called the ultimates. And it's Captain America and Hawkeye watching an old uh, an old boxing match, and, and they're talking about. It. And then um, and then Hawkeye goes, "I heard Simpson really did a number on you. How'd you get out?" And then Steve goes, "Well, God's in a miracle." And then uh, and then Hawkeye is like, "Okay," and they go back to doing the um. And then actually, wait. So. And then Hawkeye actually asks Captain America something very interesting. Okay. Okay, goes. Okay, so just one little question, accepting that th that th this was some kind of divine miracle, which obviously it was. How do you know it was God that sent it? I mean, the, the, the um, I mean, snakes. Those aren't really the big guy style, are they? And then Captain America asks, "What are you getting at?" So Hawkeye goes, "We save the world on occasion, sure, but we don't really do it in accordance with the good book, do we? I mean, we've killed before, both of us, and I'm almost certain we'll do it again." For as many people uh, as there are around us who, who love us, there are, there are just as many, if not more, who'd be happy to see us dead. Guess my question, uh, I, so I guess my question would be, why are you so certain it's God's work we are doing right now and not the other guys? And Captain America doesn't answer. That's interesting. And then it, it cuts forward to... Captain America is going down the the uh, to the prison, and he sees uh, Frank, and he go, and then Frank's like, whoa, 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 "What are you doing here? Come to gloat." And then Captain America takes the Bible and goes, "No, I'm just returning the favor." And he goes, "Okay," and he just starts the Bible from the beginning. So essentially, he's going to try and teach Frank a few lessons. Now that's the end of Ultimate Captain America. It was definitely one of my favorite Captain America stories because it really addressed. A lot of ideas of patriotism because I feel like nowadays, nowadays patriotism is misunderstood to mean that you have to like say our country has done nothing wrong. Never. It's the most righteous country of all time, which obviously it is and it's run by human beings.
and human beings are anything but righteous. But anyway, the idea is that is that if your country has made mistakes, it's fine. You can still love your country because you're loving what your country could be. In other words, you're inspired to look to how your country could be in the future if, if you put work into it. So I feel like that's that's a good uh, that's a better like conception of patriotism is you're constantly lo lo looking to make your country a better place for everyone. So that's the end of that story. Uh, I went through that pretty quick. I I liked definitely the the idea of having a Captain America from Vietnam because in Nam. Well, for one thing, when the soldiers came home, they were treated like crap. And that kind of jaded a few of them to, to America. And I can understand exactly. I, I can understand Frank's point in that he's saying is that America is this horrible country because it's done this, 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 this. It's such this laundry list of atrocities that's directly or indirectly associated, um, responsible for. But once again, what... Um, Steve says that, yeah, I know all that. I know what, what this country has done. It's done some pretty horrible stuff, but that doesn't discount what this country actually stands for. It stands for equality and all that. All right. Anyway, that's the end of that story. I think I'm going to talk about another one because it's been like too short of a time. I'm not going to log off right now. So anyway, I think I will talk. So here's something pretty cool so as you guys know uh two weeks ago on may 23rd episode 62 we did a uh latin i went to the comic book store and we came back and did a comic book haul so i got this earth one box set and earth one is basically was basically an imprint for the ultimate ver uh, for, for the dc ultimate world essentially it's the ultimate version of D it's dc ultimate so I recently finished reading the Superman story, which is Superman Earth One. And I'm just going to go over that briefly. This is written by J. Michael Straczynski and art by Shane Davis. So let me pull up DC Universe so I can, so I can put this on, on the screen so I can share the screen because I feel like it's more engaging if I do that. Okay, I'm gonna do this. All right, so share screen. All right, so here's Superman Earth One. So once again, written by J. Michael Straczynski and uh, art by Shane Davis. Okay, which the art is fantastic. All right. So we open up, it opens up actually pretty late in Clark Kent's life. And this is him moving from Smallville to Metropolis. Shows up and then he's like, his head's in the clouds because he's like, he's a small town kid going to a, a, a big um, city. It's essentially someone from like a small town in Kansas going to like New York. So he finds a place to stay. It's kind of showing that, the, um, what this is showing is that he seems kind of alone if you will, some guy tries to mug him, but once again, this dude is Kryptonian, so he kind of just walks away. Anyway, um, Clark Kent tries out for the football team and trounces everyone, obviously. Like, he knows all of the maneuver. Uh, what I like about this book is it highlights Superman's intelligence because he has the ide idyllic memory to remember every single complicated, like, play for football, and he, like, nails it all. And uh, so they sign him up and then he show so he, he interviews at this um, science lab and they go, well, we really don't have any real positions available. So what Superman does is he looks out and sees that the um, this scientific formula these scientists are working on. He fills in the formula and goes, here's the correct one. Then they come back and they go, uh, OK, don't leave to just stay here. We may have a position for you. So uh, J John is uh, so OK. So Clark is um, talking to Martha, his mother, Earth mother, and uh, he's talking about uh, about tr trying to support her. And, and they also show that he's kind of hiding from being. Th this is Clark Kent not embracing his role as Superman yet. 
So this is showing him he's doing all, all he's trying out all these di different jobs. And he, he decides, I'm going to try journalism. So he goes to the Daily Planet, tries out for a job. Uh, he, he goes, okay, so I want a job. He interviews and he goes, uh, uh, so, um, he gets a job application. But then he just throws it away. And he flies, he flies up, he flies in, into space. And then the, the, what they're showing is this is when Jonathan and Martha Kent tell him about where he came from. They were just walking in the woods and all of a sudden they saw a ship crash. Once again, he was in the ship. Hang on, this thing is taking him off the loading. And then they, they find the baby and they leave. And uh, this is showing again, Clark being uh, attacked by a bully. We kind of saw a little bit of this in Man of Steel. You could definitely see some Man of Steel-like influences in this. And they see uh, Clark Kent uh, g going to the grave of Jonathan. And he goes, I don't know if I can do this, Dad. I know you want me to be like this great hero, but I don't know if I can do this. So he's, in other words, he's starting to have doubts about being, being the superhero. And this is pretty on par with uh, Zack Snyder's uh, Man of Steel and, B and Batman v Superman, because if you see in that one, Superman is very doubtful about if he can do the role of being this hero. So anyway, we cut back to uh, a military base and, um, and um, this major walks onto the base, Major S Sandra Lee. And then she, she walks into this bunker where, they've where the government has recovered Clark's ship. And, and they've been studying the ship. And uh, they, they discover that there's like symbols drawn on the, on the molecules, on the individual molecules of the armor. It's really weird. So then next, S Superman goes in and finds that there was a fire in his room, in his, um, in his apartment. And he discovers this because he had a, a piece of his ship that was actually so hot that it was like it caused a fire so then next what he does is he goes okay so what the heck is this thing so then it starts beaming energy into clark's eyes in other words it's telling him this is where you came from while it's doing that the ship activates but then suddenly also an alien invasion fleet shows up over metropolis so you can imagine how people are feeling right about now so then the military scrambles for uh, jets but the jets are like messed up like wiped out obviously lois and jimmy being the mavericks that they are go okay so we're going to run toward the chaos and try and get some killer news pictures so they get in there jimmy is taking photos as jets are crashing and she's like oh gosh and this is showing that it's a global invasion and uh so next what they're doing is uh so, so we have clark Kent is still out and what's interesting is that, is that the ship is kind of communicating tel telepathically with Superman and showing him, it's basically downloading into his brain his origin story. So we see on, on Krypton, it's like Jor-El saying, he'll be, uh, he'll be, uh, uh, let me see, he will be alone, he will not be alone. Okay, so it, it's actually Laura going, he will be alone, he will be like them, but he will not be like them. So in other words, they knew when they were sending, sending Clark to Earth what was going to happen to him. They knew he was going to be, they knew he, the, the, the yellow sun was going to give him these godlike powers. And you saw that in Man of Steel, where, where Lara said they'll kill him. In other words, the humans will at least try to kill him. And then uh, Jor-El goes, how? He'll be a god to them. They won't be able to. All right. So next, next what happens is, uh, so we see the ship being launched and Clark and, and little baby Clark watching as the planet blows up. And then uh, Clark uh, understands now who he was. He takes off and after he sees the alien invasion and the, the aliens start deploying ground troops. And so anyway, so what Jimmy says is, okay, so here's what you do. Uh, it's, it's, so Jimmy was in, uh, had a friend of his that was in, in, in bed in Afghanistan, who, who was, and he, um, that friend related to him. There's a pattern to an invasion. First, you send the air force, uh, air forces, and the bombers to like soften up defenses. Then you send in the ground troops, and these big dudes in mech suits show up and start like trouncing the military. Then you have this this being, who says. Um, 
uh, his name is Tyrell, and he's here for Clark. This is kind of like in Man of Steel. Again, this is very similar to Man of Steel, where Zod shows up and goes, one of my people is among you. I'm here for him. Except Tyrell is here to wipe out the, the, the Kryptonians. He's not here for like some codex or anything like that. So he goes, hand him over. I'm not going to blow you up. Uh, 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 you know, he basically goes, hand him over and I won't kill you. That's it. Then the, sh the ship uh, starts to like power up, I think. And then next, Clark is watching the, uh, the destruction and he leaves the suit on this, um, on this rooftop. So again, still he's not exactly completely embracing his role as the Man of Steel that you and I all know and love. Takes off. We see these infantry guys and then they're about to attack these soldiers uh, and Lois and Jimmy. And then all of a sudden this blur rushes by them and um, takes them all out. And then Jimmy only gets one little frame of like this very low res, like in motion blur, like taking out these robots. And then next, what happens is I've got a piece of metal for this machine. The scientist, the, the head of the science lab that Clark works at is just leaving. It's just leaving town be, uh, because, again, he's afraid. And then what's interesting is uh, he, he goes, it's not my problem. So this is also similar to Spider-Man's origin. So then we get Clark. Now he's starting to realize it. So he's, uh, did you realize his role in the world? Jonathan is basically, uh, he flashes back to his time in Smallville with his mother making the suit. And then Jonathan goes, okay. Uh, um, listen. Um, okay, so for, first off, they talk about how hard it was to make the suit because, like, the suit's basically Kryptonian, so it's like impossible. So it's like really hard, hard to like cut. And then, so it shows them making the suit. The invasion's happening, and then he's, and then Tyrol shows up and goes, "Yeah, okay, so we're going to." So actually, Tyrol stops in front of Jimmy and goes. Okay, so are you the guy I'm looking for? He goes, no, I'm a news photographer. And he goes, well, we don't turn away from a story or a picture. And he goes, uh, yeah. and then the guy go, and then Tywell goes as if he's going to kill him. And then Superman shows up and like takes out that robot and then takes out a bunch more. And then, yeah, now Tyrell knows who the target is. And then anyway, he returns back to the suit and he goes, isn't it too colorful? And he goes, and essentially... Th that's okay so th that's essentially the um the colors of the of the suit that was in the kryptonian ship and he goes uh, and then he talks about what about the mask and he, she goes the mask is for and see in order to be the hero that we know you can be people have to be able to see your face they have to be able to see that you really have nothing to hide so they'll be able to relate to you better so then she says the mask is for when you're not the hero. So in other words, th this is showing why Clark Kent essentially wears the, the mask and the persona instead of Superman. So he, he puts on the suit and then so Clark goes, why an S? This is where it, it deviates from Man of Steel because in Man of Steel it was a symbol for hope. In this, it was created by the, by the, uh, the, the Kents and they said, Okay, so th th this is what you're going to be. It's essentially supposed to be a representation of who you are as a man. You're so powerful with all of your abilities. You're super, so we're going to call you Superman. So now he's in the suit. He goes around and just annihilates all of these robots. And then they homage, I love this, Action Comics number one, except instead of a car, he's holding a green tank. But it's the exact same pose and everything. And it's like... This is uh, it's, what's interesting is that to a degree, whenever Superman first shows up, he will be in this pose. Then Su Superman flies up and starts uh, taking on his air forces. And then uh, Tyrell shows up and they get into a, a battle, which is similar to the Man of Steel uh, Superman versus Zod fight. And that it's very destructive. They go through planets and stuff. And it's also discovered that Tyrell can cut um, Krypton it can and cut Superman's skin. Well, it's interesting. Uh, let me see. Tyrell says that the death of Krypton was an assassination. So what's revealed is that Tyrell's people were from 
a planet adjacent to Krypton, but they shared the red sun. And that's why Tyrell has powers too. He's affected the same way as Superman is by the yellow sun. So what they reveal is, is their planets like orbited um, non-concurrently around their sun. I don't know the proper word for it, but every so often they'll be close enough. So as, when they were close enough, the plants, uh, the two plants would go to war with each other. So what happened is, uh, is and then Superman said, uh, Tyrell says, okay, so it looked like they were gonna, it, it was a back and forth until they v visited us. And I have a theory on who the, this green ship is. So he came to us with a proposition. He said, in return for your cooperation, I will give you the means to finally destroy your enemies. The means is simplicity itself. You can launch a series of probes that will penetrate miles beneath Krypton's surface. The probes create an energy field that prevents heat from dissipating upwards from Krypton's fiery core. Over time, the heat will build to a point where the planet will become unstable and the eruption will destroy Krypton from within. So, so that's what these drills are for. And uh, that's how Krypton died. And then so he, he discovered, and then Tywell says, I've already begun the process here on Earth. And, uh, but, and then Su Superman en engages in battle once again, but then Tyrell hits him with this beam that essentially launches him, uh, that essentially, imagine it, it's like this. In Man of Steel, when Superman was fighting that world engine thing, and then he got in that gravity well and just pressed him down to the ground, that's what this is. And it's that scene, and then we have a, a nice little conversation with uh, Clark, or with a, uh, Clark and Jonathan again, and then we says, um, so they engage in this battle, and then he feels like I'm waking and dreaming. I'm just qu quickly going through this scene. And it's essentially showing, it's a, it's a conversation where Jonathan was basically relating to Clark that eventually you're gonna ha have to uh, pick a side, humanity or the other guys. So that's when people like, that's when we know who we are. That's when people will show up and take yourself. Oh, okay. So anyway, so mm -hmm. actually here's what Jonathan said. So he goes, when I was growing up, uh, uh, so essentially what they're saying is uh, Clark was saying, I'm alone. How do I know people are going to like, to accept me as their savior? And how do I know that they're going to, that they're more, more like me, that they'll stand together with me? So Jonathan says, when I was uh, growing up, I drifted from one thing to the next. I drifted through school into, into the Marines. I never really felt like myself. This one day in boot camp, this grunt named Kowalski headbutted me during a training maneuver, totally against the rules, and, and I saw red. I, I went for him. When we say I won't uh, take this anymore, th that's when we know who we are and, who, and what we'll tolerate. Until we're tested, we don't know those things. That's when we wake up, and that's when we know uh, who we are, and that's when uh, people will show up and take your side. What's interesting about this, this story came out. I'm trying to figure that out. I have a reason for, for looking this up. This story came out in 2010. So, Injustice, I have to look out when, when Injustice came out because if you notice, I'm just looking up when Injustice came. 2000, no, Injustice, Gods Among Us, came out in 2013. So this is a predecessor to Injustice, kind of, in that he said, and that, so what Jonathan Kent was saying is that when, when we say we won't tolerate this anymore, and what does that remind you of? That scene in Injustice where super where after Lois Lane has been killed and everything, where he decides I'm going to take over this world, he goes, I'm not going to take it anymore. It's my way or the highway. And then that's when people start taking sides. I love this because I just saw this when I was looking at it actually right now in this episode. I was like, oh, that, that sounds a lot like Injustice. It would be hilarious if they said, actually, Earth-1 is the origin for injustice, but it's not. But anyway, all right, next. So now we get, again, back in this red uh, beam. L Lois try and get Clark out. So what they do is they grab a chain, uh, so they grab a, a cement mixer 
drive it through the beam, uh, beam and tell Superman, and Superman grabs onto the chain. They pull him out. Then he's powered back up. And then he shows up, and he and Tyrol have this awesome fight, which again is like the Man of Steel uh, battle. And the, they go through. So then, also, who show what should show up? What should happen is the Superman ship, the ship that brought him to Earth, powers up, and then just zooms away. And the government's like, "Where'd that thing go?" And then it just. So I love this where where uh, Tyrol goes. Any final word to the billions who will die? For, uh, for for a crime of having sheltered you, a Superman goes, hmm, oh yeah, duck. And then the uh, title goes, wait, what? And the ship just rams into him. And he goes, uh, he, he, he goes, Kryptonian metal is almost as, as impervious as me. So what he does, he takes the ship and just flies it straight through Tyrell's ship, destroying it. And uh, so what's next is then... Uh, uh, what it, it, um, now in Tyrell's ship, it's under a red sun. Uh, there's red sun radiation. So Superman gets in there and then they have a good old fashioned uh, round of fisticuffs. And then uh, uh, Superman escapes by j jumping away from this, uh, from the red sun radiation off the ship and then just takes off. And then Tyler's ship is blown up. And then uh, this scene, I think, was reflected in Zack Snyder's Justice League. Because in that in the scene where Superman gets the red suit, you hear Jonathan Kent eventually saying, "Okay, so fly, Clark, it's time." And you see this. He goes, uh, "He goes, live, Clark. Follow your passion. Show the world what you can do. You need to show the world what you can do. Fly, son, it's time." It's, he basically says that, and then uh, he, I love this. You, you just see Superman nonchalantly just walking away. So cool. And then what happens is the uh, is, is the scientist guy that was fleeing the, the scene that Clark tried to bring a prototype of the alien d device to kind of I know help people uh, c comes to Clark for um, for advice on like science. I mean, now apparently he needs them. And then Clark goes, "Not my problem." He just walks away. And then he gets he he finally um, puts on the mask for the first time and shows up in the Daily Planet. And what's great is that so. What, what, uh, so, so what's hilarious is that, uh, Perry White and Jimmy have this going back and forth because Jimmy likes to, uh, uh essentially, he takes forever to turn in the photos because he always imports them at like the highest resolution possible because he says you want to get the actual action image. So what's great is that he, he's the only, one, the Daily Planet, which was the dying newspaper at the time of the storyline basically gets the only image of Superman and the only interview of Superman. And then, uh, and then Clark Kent goes, oh yeah, uh, his name is Superman. Uh, and then they go, how, how do you know all this about him? He's like, oh yeah, I interviewed him like five minutes ago. And then, uh, so Perry Wright goes, no, 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 you work for me now. If you make up the story, I will bury you, but please write, just, just write. And then, uh, and then the story comes out and Perry White's selling newspapers. And then this is everyone like we, um, this is everyone reacting to, to Superman. And then where we see here is some people in the Arctic. And then all of a sudden they don't notice like the Kryptonian ship crash landing. And then this is Superman essentially making the forces of solitude. Here's Lois Lane in the building. And then they see Superman in the end. So that was Superman Earth One. I'm just gonna end share my screen. This was my favorite Superman origin story, I think. Very much my favorite because it hinted at that whole, it hinted at that feeling of isolation that Superman feels. And I like the storylines where they make it so Clark is not sure of himself yet until he puts on the suit and does this supermanning, if you will, in order to be the hero that we all know and love. All right, that was Superman Earth One and Captain and Ultimate Captain America. Two fantastic storylines. I mean, I am just wow, blown away with those ones. So anyway, I'm gonna give you guys a quick update on the podcast and then I'm gonna sign off. Oh, by the way, so what I'm thinking of doing is so every Tuesday I do a Halo podcast, but I'm thinking of alternating it like every other Tuesday doing Halo because 
I also kind of want to cover Mass Effect, but I don't want to overextend myself in terms of all the shows. I'll, I'll, I'll see what's going on. I'll see what I can do. But anyway, the schedule should be um, same as usual, except tomorrow you're going to get an extra Under Two Capes episode because uh, that way Lyle and I can do our Suicide Squad episode. This Friday, uh, we're going to record the anniversary episode. So that will probably, most likely come out, come out on Friday as well. And that's the one year anniversary of Under Two Capes, which by one year, I mean the, it should be the anniversary of when I uploaded the first episode. So that was when like the very first episode came out. I'm just try trying to get, make sure I it's the exact date. The exact date was, was June, actually it was June 7th. Okay, June 7th. All right, well, uh, we're going to actually celebrate the, um, the anniversary um, this Friday. But it was June 7th, man, time flies. So it's actually, it's actually tomorrow, so we'll do that. All right, so, we'll, so I'll, I'll text a lot and tell them actually tomorrow is the anniversary. But anyway, hope you guys enjoyed this episode. We're going to do like, a, we have a lot of great content coming to you guys. And I um, hope you guys enjoyed my, uh, my analysis of these two storylines. Once again, please check out the YouTube channel. And also um, a way to help this podcast get more visibility, particularly on Apple. If you have an Apple account, uh, go, go on there and get, give us a five-star review if you like the podcast and, and like to put, put us a little, put a little comment in there and we'll read them on the air. We'll, we'll read reviews on the air. Uh, it's just that way the podcast gets more visibility. And I'm going to put the link to the YouTube channel in the description of the audio version um, for, for the podcast. That way it goes out to everyone. And that way you, you can get the, uh, you, you just have to go to, to the link and click on it to get to our YouTube channel where we have like, the Star Wars show, Knights of Mandalore. We have the Orbital Drop Shock podcast. We have the Under Two Capes News. We have the Snyder stuff and all that. Anyway, hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, enjoyed the, this episode and we will see you tomorrow for actually the anniversary episode and, uh, and our analyses of our, our own Suicide Squad members and the Bad Batch. Anyway. Have a great rest of your of your Sunday night. Of uh, Sunday is the time of recording this, and uh, stay heroic, everyone. Bye bye.